Het mooiste cadeau dat ik ooit mocht ontvangen kreeg ik een dag voor het overlijden van mijn moeder. Ze pakte me weg. Hello everyone. I hope that uh, that you're doing well today. My name is uh, Glenn Crawford and I'm honored to be uh, the moderator today for this uh, exciting and, and hopefully very uh, illuminating and educational uh, conversation on queer elders, a uh, global conversation on remembrance, respect and reflection. So um, I would like to sort of start off by uh, thanking all of you uh, our audience for uh, tuning in today, uh, whether you're watching us live or uh, whether you watch it later uh, in the recording that we're that we're doing today. And of course, I would be completely remiss if I didn't thank all of our wonderful panelists whom I'll introduce to all of you uh, shortly. Unfortunately, uh, I have I regret that um, to mention that uh, Alejandra Sarda Chandia Ramine uh, is home ill and uh, unfortunately is unable to join us. Uh, she was a, she's a translator, a feminist, and a sexual rights activist with a long trajectory at the local level in Argentina, regionally in Latin America, Abia Liala, and globally, and her wisdom and experience will certainly be missed uh, today. Uh, I know all of you uh, wish her a speedy recovery and, and good health. I'd also uh, like to respect, uh, recognize that many of us are situated on indigenous lands uh, and that we pay respect to the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people who are the traditional guardians of this land. Uh, we acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in Ottawa and across the globe. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor the courageous leaders, past, present, and future. So I'd also like to thank some of uh, our presenting organizations. Uh, first of all, Dignity Network Canada, which is a coalition of 52 organizations across Canada involved in and interested in international 2S LGBTQ issues. Also, Feate Canada Pride, which is Canada's National Association of Pride Organizations. And of course, Capital Pride, who is uh, doing a wonderful job uh, having this video here for us today. It's part of uh, this year's Capital Pride Festival. And this year's theme is We Still Demand. And it pays homage to the 50th anniversary of the We Demand demonstration in Ottawa on Parliament Hill, which was the first ever queer rights organization, uh, demonstration, I should say, in Canada. Today, the actual day, August uh, 28th, was the date of the demo, which makes having this fascinating international discussion on queer elders all the more special and timely today. I'm also sorry to say that it's recently been reported that Ottawa's beloved Rainbow Crosswalk at the intersection of Bank and Somerset Streets has been damaged and in an apparent act of uh, homophobic vandalism. And as we reflect on the heroism and bravery of our elders' tireless activism in the early years of our civil rights movement, we also recognize that our community must still demand for our full rights, safety, and dignity, no matter where we live across the globe. Thank you. A big thank you, of course, to our event sponsors, who are the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to Canada and QP, which is Canada's largest national public service employee union with 700,000 members. CUPE is providing financial support for this event 
and we are grateful to them for their ongoing support of human rights and the 2S LGBTIQ communities across the country. This session is also part of a series of virtual panels happening across Canada this summer, supported by CUPE and organized by Dignity Network Canada and Feote Capital Pride, designed to connect the local to the global. And today's topic is queer elders and the growing global movement to connect and support our elders. So today we're gonna to have about 90 minutes uh, for this really important discussion. And our goal today is to bring together several awesome activists from around the world who will speak to their own experiences and their ideas around issues impacting queer elders in their contexts. So I will finally <laughs> introduce all of them to you. So our first uh, panelist is from Vancouver and the Squamish Nation, uh, and that's Sempulan uh, Stuart Gonzalez, and is a proud two-spirit man of the Musqueam and Squamish ancestry, born and raised in North Vancouver. He is a father of three children, 11 grandchildren, and 11 great-grandchildren, and has been married to three women and three men, and is currently single. Uh, and you were, uh, I, you also mentioned in your bio that you were born to spirit or gay, uh, but that it's taken many years to learn uh, to accept and to love himself. So before I introduce uh, the other panelists, I will just ask you a quick question uh, and just ask, starting here in Canada, could you give us some perspective on elders in your community on the West Coast? What is the traditional role of elders in two spirit communities and how do you see your role as an elder? Clement Tommy, Glenn, fellow panelists, and Simple Yon. My ancestral name is Simple Yon. My English or given name is Stuart Gonzalez. I do have ancestry from Mapuche, Chile. Um, my great grandfather married my great grandmother, who is Squamish. Um, thank you for all our panelists across Mother Earth. Um, it's very nice to see and meet all of you. <clears throat> um, the the role that I um, carry in my community of North Vancouver, of Squamish Musqueam territory, uh, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Skokomish, um, our roles are changing because um, through colonization, our two-spirit LGBTQ2+ um, trans um, people were uh, segregated and the um, Christianity really broke down the roles of who we are, um, you know, our LGBTQ plus two-spirited um, members were the mediators, there were the marriage counselors, uh, they could talk to the wind, talk to the animals, and, you know, not um, all of us had specific roles to play within our community. Um, in modern in modern times, um, I'm seeing that the roles are changing. Um, we're now seeing a lot more acceptance within my communities, and I, I do know there are um, uh, members of my community who are older than me that are finally comfortable uh, sharing who they are as a two spirited elder. Um, the amazing thing is that um, when I was growing up as a two-spirit or gay man, it wasn't the safest place for me to grow up on the reserve. Um, so I navigated into the city and I was ashamed to be Native. I was ashamed to be Indigenous, ashamed to be Aboriginal. So I found myself um, immersing myself with other ethnicities within the, the gay community. Um, it wasn't until I started doing a lot of personal growth and personal healing that I started to learn to accept and love me. Um, you know, I'm a residential school and Indian day school survivor. So there's a lot of childhood trauma, not only for myself, but other people in, in our communities. And some people aren't able to get past their trauma. Um, you know, I'm really grateful that I have family members that supported me through the dark times in my life and supported me in the 
amazing work that I do within our communities today. Um, you know, I'm really proud that I'm able to speak my parents' languages of Musqueam or Hankanitman and Khopmish because um, through government policies, it made it against the law for us to speak our languages. And so we're seeing a resurgence of our languages with, with younger people in our communities and our neighboring communities, and which is, uh, which is uh, amazing to see the, um, the hunger for knowledge and language because who we are as human beings, you know, we all have languages across, across Mother Earth. Languages are so unique to each um, people because it keeps us connected to our ancestors. So, you know, all the years of growing up and, you know, being very um, traumatized for speaking language, um, I'm really grateful that I was really bullheaded and really stubborn and with and kept and held on to our languages because you know that's who we are as Khopish, that's who we are as Khmasquim, that's who we are as Selewatos. And I'm seeing that resurgence across the West Coast. Um, we're seeing a lot of acceptance of two-spirited people within our communities. We still have a lot, a, a lot of work to do, but we're getting there. And, you know, I, I always say, you know, I, I sit on a couple of other panels and, you know, 45 years ago, we didn't see um, someone like myself being utilized in, in a public forum like this. And so I'm really grateful, you know, I always um, pay homage and pay respect to our drag queen grandmothers, our drag king grandfathers, you know, again, Stonewall was a riot and, you know, we're still here. Um, we're loud and proud. I'm loud and proud. Um, up until a week ago, I had white hair. <laughs> so I decided to dye my hair purple. So, you know, it just so it goes to show that, you know, it changes, change is positive. Um, you know, I'm really grateful that I get to see um, some of you via Zoom, but, you know, this is what the, the world we live in. You know, COVID has really affected a lot of people, and especially in, in our communities of LGBTQS communities that, you know, we unfortunately aren't able to gather in person. And I hope in the near future that we can meet in person and we can give each other a hug because hugs are medicine. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, Glenn. I think it did. Yeah, absolutely. I think it gave people an understanding of, um, of your personal history and also your community's history. Um, and uh, I love that you um, sort of bring it back to community and how important it is, how difficult the pandemic has been on all of us, but particularly for queer communities that, um, you know, don't have sort of, uh, I guess, a more sort of um, traditional family. We have, uh, instead of biological families, we have logical families, as our Mr. Maupin used to say. So, um, it, it, you know, community is important and it's been challenging. So having the technology to be able to communicate and to meet all of you is, is wonderful. So thank you very much for that. So I'll pass it uh, on and, and introduce uh, our next panelist from Mexico, who is uh, Gloria Caraga Perez. Uh, she's a feminist lesbian, originally from Guadalajara, Jalisco. Uh, since 1978, she emigrated to Mexico City uh, to pursue her master's studies in social psychology. Uh, in 1979, she was incorporated to the Faculty of Psychology in UNAM, and since then, has, she has been a professor and research at that university. She is the co-founder of the UNAM Gender Studies Program and, to, uh, and of two LGBT NGOs. From 2008 to 2014, she was the ILGA co-secretary general. Her interest is focused on feminism, masculinities, sexuality, and human rights. She has an extensive international experience and multiple publications on the topic of her interest. So well, first of all, welcome, Gloria. And uh, my question for you is, uh, you have been involved in 2SLGBIT uh, 
TIQ organizing, both in Mexico and globally for several decades. How has your role changed over the years? And how do you see your role as an elder of the LGBTIQ movement in both Mexico and also globally? Um, hello, my friends and everybody following the panel. Thanks for inviting me to be part here. And I'm very happy of the discussion as elder, elderly people are not in front of the discussion on LGBT movement. And I think it's very important to share and reflect on ourselves and the challenges that we have faced. My trajectory in the, in the defense of LGBT rights now for more than 30 years has been a very enriching and interesting experience. As you say, I had the opportunity to participate locally and globally, and I think that gave me great opportunities. But above all, the possibility to build a broad perspective of, on what happens in different regions. In this trajectory, I went through many fortunate and some unfortunate in circumstances, but all of them enriching and powerful. Today, I continue to be active but with a close interaction with activists of different ages. In Arcoiris Foundation, our organization, most of the participants are young, very young people, and these intergenerational dialogues seem very important to me. In this diverse context, I feel comfortable to continue being active and in being elder, I appreciate the, the recognition that other defenders have for my work, even from other social movements and some authorities, which facilitates now the work in order to put the experience in the incidence of important definitions. But now, mainly to continue learning and reflecting on the everyday challenges we face. In the last months, my work as everyone's have been reduced in part by the COVID pandemic. But still, LGBT networks have been very active in the international work and in the intergovernmental intergovern spaces. As far as I can see, new leaderships are bringing new perspectives that challenge us to maintain a proactive look of that definition of the definition of new roots and conceptions that we are changing maybe every day in Mexico and in Latin America. The construction of networks is at the center of my work, supporting the strengthening of organizations as well as the recognition of new leaderships. This has meant for me the possibility of expanding my work. And uh, there is no doubt that the unity is a strength and we are experiencing this on a daily basis. Fundación Arcoiris, for example, is now coordinating two national networks. The support network for LGBT migrants and refugee seekers and the hate crimes against LGBT LGBT people watch, where more than 80 organizations from all over the country participate. This is a major effort that requires the development of different capacities, but above, above all, the strength to follow up on these complicated processes. I mean, migration and hate crimes are in the center of the main challenge that we're facing now in Mexico. We also participate in the Violence Observatory of Ilgalak as a regional uh, initiative. But look, precisely with these experiences, what we have seen is that, the, that older LGBT people, at least in Mexico, are losing visibility or interest in participating. I know several colleagues gays and lesbians who also remain active with more than 60 years old, but they are very few. 
and actually knowing the situation of LGBT people of this age and older is very difficult. We have been uh, participating, participating in some research, but uh, to really identify where are the other LGBT people is very difficult. We have not enough information about uh, the way they are living, which are the, the main needs they, they need. And I, I think that this is a, 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 a big challenge that we're facing now and, and that we need to really recognize the work they did, but mainly the needs they now have. I think that this is one of the things that we have to, to begin thinking because in especially specifically in Mexico, I think that this is something that we haven't reflected on and, and we need to do. Yeah, I know um, in, in Canada and uh, I'm involved in an organization called the Ottawa Senior Pride Network and uh, it, of course they are, many of the members of that organization were sort of the early activists of the movement here in Canada. And, you know, as they are getting elder, older, uh, they have more, uh, you know, challenges to, you know, they are still passionate about uh, their rights and, and about uh, the challenges that they're now facing in terms of, um, as you say, you know, disability or, or um, if they have to go into uh, long-term care homes. And, um, you know, this is all sort of new territory for our community um, because it's sort of the first generations of people who, um, you know, are facing that, you know, do they go back into the closet if they go into a, into a home, you know, a home care? Um, are they going to be safe there? Are the staff trained there. So it's, it's something that, you know, is important. And as you say, the activists uh, that are active now are very young and maybe aren't aware of that, you know, not only is there uh, a need for them in the future that these things are addressed, but, you know, immediately now for our elders who um, have, have built our community from, from nothing, right, who were the, who were the four fathers and the grandparents of, of our community, um, it's, it's really critical work. And uh, I, I really appreciate everything that you're doing in Mexico. I think that's fantastic. It's, it's absolutely necessary for sure. Um, so I will move on now to our third panelist, uh, who's from the Netherlands. And this is Evelyn van de Putte. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, she's a writer and a photographer a trainer from the Netherlands who is at the moment working on her 10th publication. Two of them are about uh, the queer, el queer elderly. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna pass on pronouncing them in, <laughs> in Dutch if that's okay. Uh, and just say that Roaring Silence uh, contains 27 life stories of LGBT seniors and New Names contains 18 stories of transgender seniors. Uh, Evelyn is a trainer as well. She trains professionals in diversity and gender matters, especially professionals in health and senior care. So my question uh, for you, Evelyn, is uh, you work on the issue of 2S LGBTIQ seniors in the Netherlands, which is a country with a growing and larger population of queer seniors. And so what are some of the issues you see as most pressing? And then also, um, what do you do uh, to grow awareness for professionals about gender and sexual diversity? Yeah, uh, first of all, also thank you for the invitation for this uh, conversation. I'm very honored to be part of it and to meet you all. Um, uh, yes, I'm. The last to start with the last question, what do we do in the Netherlands to raise awareness? Um, I'm working also for uh, the foundation Rose 50 plus. When I translate it, it will be something like um, Foundation Pink 50 plus. That's an um, organization, a cooperation, I must say, um, between the elderly organization, one of the biggest ones, the AMBO and the COC, that is the oldest and the largest queer organization in the Netherlands. Um, what we do with the Pink 50 Plus and what I also do on personal um, 
uh, how you say that from, from as an author is that I we try with our team of ambassadors like we call our volunteers to go on to go to um, care homes uh, and other organizations where seniors are uh, living or where they are coming to talk about diversity and especially about gender diversity and sexual diversity. Um, and what we see when we are talking to uh, managers, for example, for the um, care homes, still they say, we don't know these people. Um, a little bit like uh, Gloria said before, the older generation of queer people is still invisible also in the Netherlands, um, what is a country um, well known for is uh, acceptance of the queer community. But when we're talking about the really older uh, generation, they still are a little bit careful to be out of the closet, especially when they are um, in a care home. Because what we see in the Netherlands as well is that the professionals, but also the students, like uh, nurses or uh, doctors or whatever, um, in the education, they don't talk about the combination diversity and seniors. Uh, when, when we come there, um, it's one, most of the time, the first and the last time when they learn something about it. So you can imagine what will happen um, in a care home, in a senior home where everybody is running out of time because there is a lack of uh, uh, persons who, for doing the work, they are not aware of this diversity. So even the managers, like I said before, they still say, no, we don't have queer elderly. We don't know these people, never heard about it. About it. Or they say, sometimes they say to me, we don't have that problem. And then I looked at them and I said, the problem? Well, um, we never talk about it. I said, and that, is my, that might be the problem. If you don't talk about diversity, and then you, of course, can think like the people thought in the past. If you don't talk about it, when you don't mention it, it doesn't exist. So what we try to do is um, with, together with those uh, 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 group of um, ambassadors, we have um, uh, around 100 people who are working all over the Netherlands who do give information, who are able to talk on meetings about this. We organize uh, photo exhibitions, lectures. Uh, we try to train professionals so that they get more aware about the uh, seniors from our community. And um, most of the people, it's not that they don't want to treat them right or equal, they are just not aware of the stories. I'm also a storyteller and I use the stories of the elderly who I um, uh, could interview for my books, but also in other situations, I use these stories, these life stories, to open the eyes of um, our professionals. Because when you hear a touching story, it may, might be uh, more uh, creating that awareness or it, it will come more into your heart than when I just present you some uh, notes and figures and some numbers, you know, then if I say, well, it's about 10% of the people of your care home, yeah, then you can say, okay, well, I don't know them. But if I tell you a story of maybe a mother of 91 years old who has a transgender daughter uh, from 65 years old, and that daughter wants to visit her mother regularly, like other daughters do, that the mother here, every time when the daughter walks in, ah, that's that mother, that's the lady, it's the mother of that man, half man, half wife person, you know, then the mother who's over 19 already feels sad, but she's also shy to say something. And what happens? She will be in her room. She will stay at her room, don't 
participate uh, the nice uh, meetings, don't participate in the dinners anymore. And the mother is not a queer senior, she is the mom of the queer senior. So telling these stories, I think it will help to open up the eyes of our professionals to see, look, this is what happened when you don't when you don't talk about it, when there is no information, when there is no knowledge um, from the stories of our queer, um, queer senior generation. Because a lot of people don't realize um, that it was different. I don't have to explain that to you, but a lot of people are not so involved. They don't realize how different it was for 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. There was no information, there was no, uh, um, no way to meet each other. You were thinking you were just the only crazy one and you were kicked out of the family or your church or your work or other things. A lot of people don't realize it. And I always said all those stories and all those experiences, the senior people, like all of us, we are carrying our experience in our backpack. And when you are getting older and more vulnerable, you, you start to get afraid. And also in the Netherlands, and even in the Netherlands, I must say, we see that um, the oldest senior, um, like 80 plus and, and older, that there is a chance that they go back into the closet when they need help. And that's what we want to uh, another one too, so we, we try to work on that social acceptation, but also the personal empowerment of the senior, uh, queer seniors. Um, one of the programs uh, we do, and that's uh, on my initiative, based on the two books you mentioned, is, um, is the Tour d'Amour, and maybe we can just um, see a little piece of that. Yeah, I'll just um, get our tech person, Tate, who's been amazing helping us uh, uh, to show the film. Yeah, I will just say one minute. The mooiste cadeau that I ever received was a day before the overlijden van my mother. She packed me beet and said, schaam je nooit voor je geaardheid. Since March 2014, reizen we met the Tour de Moor door Nederland and België om aandacht te vragen voor seksuele en genderdiversiteit. Dit doen we aan de hand van levensverhalen van LHBT-ouderen en bijpassende liedjes. Zowel professionals als vrijwilligers binnen zorg- en welzijnsorganisaties zijn zich niet altijd bewust van deze diversiteit. Het is meestal geen onwil, maar onwetendheid. LHBT-ouderen zijn opgegroeid in een tijd waarin ze niet over hun gevoelens konden praten. Uit angst voor pesterijen en onbegrip doen ze dat nog steeds niet makkelijk. Zeker niet in zorgafhankelijke situaties. Juist daarom is kennis over dit thema zo belangrijk. Pas dan krijgen alle ouderen zorg op maat en kan iedereen vrij over zijn of haar leven vertellen. Jezelf kunnen zijn is toch een recht van iedereen? Ja, de Tour d'Amour is echt heel erg belangrijk. Er wordt met ouderen sowieso, met ouderen tussen ouderen, veel te weinig over seksualiteit gesproken. Laat staan over homoseksualiteit of lesbisch zijn of nou ja, eigenlijk alle letters van de LHBTI. Uh, ik zou eigenlijk vooraf kunnen beginnen, maar ik begin achteraf. Omdat we heel vaak na de Tour en ook in de pauze gesprekken hebben met mensen over het onderwerp homoseksualiteit. En dat zijn gesprekken die anders, denk ik, niet plaats zouden vinden. Dus ik vind het daarom alleen al belangrijk. En de andere kant, dat is dus eigenlijk de reden waarom ik van oorsprong meedoe. Ik vind dat de verhalen van met name oudere homoseksuelen en lesbiennes de wereld in moeten. De wereld moet ons leren kennen. Heel veel mensen realiseren zich niet waar we deze mensen vandaan komen. Hoe ze hebben geleden onder het feit dat men destijds zag, dacht dat homoseksualiteit vies en zondig was. Of zelfs een ziekte. En dat transgender ouderen al helemaal niet bestonden. De Tour d'Amour is heel belangrijk om 
als er nog gepest wordt in zorginstellingen, om dat te voorkomen en mensen informatie te geven. Maar ik vind het ook heel belangrijk voor de toekomst van mijn generatie dat het goed blijft gaan, want de wereld wordt heel populistisch, heel erg rechts. En ik heb geen zin om daarin mee te gaan en ook niet om straks de kast terug in te moeten als ik in een zorginstelling ben, omdat ik zeg van nee, laat maar, ik blijf er boven op mijn kamer zitten. Ik hoef niet meer naar buiten, um, want dat doe je erg gauw als je niet meer welkom bent. En daarom doe ik de Tour de Moer. Het mooiste cadeau dat ik ooit mocht ontvangen, kreeg ik een dag voor het overlijden van mijn moeder. Ze pakte me. So thank you, Evelyn, for sharing that video with us. It's great. Uh, and I think it's going to hopefully tell, um, give, give people a little bit better understanding of some of the things uh, that you do. And, and as we were just saying, uh, talking amongst ourselves while we were, uh, the video was playing, we were just saying how um, important it is for people to understand people through hearing their stories and taking the time to listen, um, which I think is really what today is all about, right? We're listening to people from across the globe tell their stories um, and hear their perspectives so that we can better understand, um, you know, what's going on maybe with ourselves, but also, uh, you know, internationally as well. So Davis, uh, thank you very, very much for being patient. Uh, I'll introduce you now from Ghana. Uh, Davis Il Mac Iliala is the founder and executive director of the Interfaith Diversity Network of West Africa. In February 2018, uh, sorry, 2008, Davis received the Bishop Desmond Tutu Award for Human Rights and Social Justice from the World Pride and Power Organization. Uh, this award reflected Davis's tireless efforts over the previous 25 years to advocate for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender plus West Africans in the face of significant opposition from the government and religious organizations. On February 14th, uh, 2019, Davis was installed as a warrior chief and is seated on an ancient stool named Nana Kwaiku Adu, the first from As Asafo and Napo number two company, Cape Cast, Ghana. I hope I pronounced that properly. <laughs> My apologies for stumbling. Um, Davis is currently living in Ghana, where he continues to administer his traditional leadership as High Chief alongside his duty as the Executive Director of IDNOWA. And Davis, thank you very much uh, for agreeing to participate. Uh, you are a High Chief in Ghana. What does this mean in your context and what does it mean to aid elder gay man in this, uh, to, an, to be an elder gay man in this role? Thank you so much, Glenn. I can see how you struggle um, when you want that. <laughs> when you, Thanks when for you, me. <laughs> no, it's all right. When you wanted to pronounce um, Anafo Asafo, number two company um, from Cape Coast, Ghana. Um, but you tried, you did very well. You got there in the end. And 60%. <laughs> yeah. so, so back to your question. Um, what does it mean to be um, an eye chief? And in fact, what does it mean to be a chief, um, a queer chief and an elder gay man, openly gay man? There's a lot um, there. Um, I have been around mm -hmm. um, the movement or the struggle for LGBTIQ um, inclusion and affirmation for quite many years in West Africa. I started actually from Nigeria um, and faced all kinds of um, 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 attacks, um, including violence attack, um, including being um, disowned and disclaimed. Um, there are so many scenarios, but um, I wanted to, the younger generation 
um, um, who sadly today many don't recognize, like Gloria too was saying, what the elderly ones have done. I wanted to leave something. I wanted to leave a legacy that young LGBTIQ people, when come out after me, would see and have hope and know that, mm -hmm. yes, there is someone like them. So despite the persecution that I face, I wouldn't go down below or go into the closet. Now, um, bringing the John Hill story forward, in 2000 and um, within 2016 and 17, that I have started the Interfaith Diversity Network of West Africa, which is a regional network, but based in Ghana. Um, it means that my work will have to do quite a lot in living in Ghana and supporting um, um, the network as, as I want to. And um, before then, I also um, have been around Ghana a long time. I know Ghana, I know people in Ghana um, for quite a long time as a West African born citizen. Um, but it, it was in 2019 that um, I got an invitation from um, a family um, um, that I have been uh, choosing to be uh, made a chief um, because they have seen uh, the works that I've been doing, the contributions that I have been making for development. And they think that if I join this family, I am going to bring progress. Um, this is something that I didn't take lightly um, because if you follow the story that you read in the media, it is perceived that LGBTIQ people, young or old, are worthless people, um, are, are taboos, are people that doesn't have value in our African society or in our West African society. So for me to be recognized in this way and to be invited in this way to come and lead a community, um, I thought this was an amazing thing. Um, so I accepted, but there is a condition. The stools that we sit as chiefs in Ghana as ancestral, it means that they are living deities. That means that not anyone can be, even if you are choosing, will be allowed to sit on that stool, except you are proved worthy that you are qualified um, to sit on that stool. So they consulted the deity of the stool and immediately the stool gave an approval. Remember, that um, the, the rhetoric you will always hear from Africa that homosexuality is unknown, is unimported. Now, this is me that want to sit on an ancestral stool. And when I was vetted, the stool said, yes, this is the right person for this to sit on this stool. And so my sexuality was also taken into account. And that gave me more belief in what I have always known that it is not a taboo and that our ancestors are not against us because of our sexuality. In fact, our ancestors embraced us. I was embraced and was lifted up and was sat on that stool of honor with dignity. So yes, that is what it means to be an high chief and a queer person in a community that all you hear about is that LGBTIQ people are taboos. No, from that day, I stopped being a taboo. I stopped being um, an outcast. I became an indigenous heritage of that community and family. And then a year after, um, um, in 2020, just before, in fact, let me tell you one thing that is significant. My lifting to sit on the stool happened on the Valentine day. So sometimes I have wondered if the ancestors and the deities were actually LGBT people and that they are having that love and romance with me on a very significant day because I was lifted as a chief on the 14th of February. And then the, 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 the year after, when I would have been, when they want to lift me up again to make me the chiefs of all the warriors chiefs, this is why I am proud to call myself an high chief because one year after I was again elevated to be the leaders of all the warriors chief. But then something happened. Um, all preparation has been made. 
And just before we will go to the palace, to the paramount chief, um, for him to um, accept and install me, some enemies of the queer community or queer family or queer people went and did research and pulled out all of the articles that I have written and have accepted myself and all of those things. Some articles I have written and published over 10 years ago, over 15 years ago. Somebody with skills, they have to pull all of those things and send to the traditional council. Do you actually know the person you people are parading and want to give such a title? How can you of lift this person to this position? Um, um, have you read, have you gone online? Have you seen the links to what he has done? Um, but again, to show that I was accepted by the ancestors, um, the Paramount chief said, it is too late to go back. He has been sitting on the stool for all this while. And this is the time that you bring all of these things. And so I make my argument that I sit on a stool that have accepted me. It's not the paramount chief to accept me. That is ceremonial. The first is the stool. And if the stool have accepted me, then who else can stand on my way? Um, and, and so I was taken to the palace and was gasseted properly and was accepted fully and then came back and had a ceremony, not as a closeted chief, but as an open LGBT affirming queer elder, leading people, and up till today, I still have my influence. I still have my voice. This week um, 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 to next week is our ceremony when we will all feed our stools and do the traditional ceremonies. And I, as one of the chiefs, will be doing the rituals and will be given honor um, to my ancestors as an openly elder um, where chief um, I'm not hiding or not being in the closet. And so I am accepted by God. I am accepted um, um, by the deities. And that is why despite all that I have been through, I have never, um, I didn't die. I didn't fall, um, um, get a serious condition that would put me away because I'm going to live long and continue to change that narrative. But we are clean and we are who we are, and we didn't choose who we are. We are born this way. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much, Davis. That was really powerful. I think, um, you know, it, it's so critical, as you say, to be visible and to, to do it from such a position, um, I know, is, is making a huge difference in your communities uh, to younger people and even to people our age, you know, who are looking at you and, and seeing such a brave, strong uh, and articulate um, representation of, uh, of community. Uh, it's, it's outstanding. So thank you so much for, for speaking and, and again, for joining us. So now that um, we've all had sort of an opportunity to, uh, to meet virtually <laughs> all of our panelists, uh, I'm going to open it up uh, to more of a, a sort of an open discussion. So all of you uh, feel free to sort of jump in when you have something uh, that you'd like to say on um, these next topics. So uh, the first question um, would be uh, to, to think about uh, getting back to sort of the, the event name, uh, you know, a global conversation on remembrance, ref respect and reflection. So in terms of respect, uh, what does it mean to you in your context to respect elders? Uh, what would you like to see in the 2S LGBTIQ communities around the issue of respect uh, to our elders? <laughs> well, I think I have, I'm sitting also among elders. Maybe let me have a bit of go here and then... <laughs> yes, so I grew up in a culture where when you see an elder in the bus standing, you, the younger person, you get up and you give them the seat. I grew up in a culture where you don't talk back when an elder is talking to you. I grew up in a culture where when you see an elder carrying things on their head, you help them to take those things and carry it and don't look at them struggling 
that is the culture. We, I grew up in a culture where elders are to be treated with respect. But as Evelyn was saying, I have also, um, by the um, course of when I worked in the UK, witnessed elderly abuse of different kind in nursing home and in care homes because of who they are. And I, you know, spent time challenging um, that type of behavior and did a lot of reports. In fact, got people dismissed from the job because if you are not ready um, um, to respect the people that you are paid to care for, then you shouldn't be in the profession. Nothing shouldn't be about money. It should be about service and caring. And so I have fought some battles around there. So for me, um, being elderly, it's also for the young people, especially the young queer people, to appreciate that the, many of the things they are enjoying are sacrifices that are made uh, by elderly, the elderly ones have made huge sacrifices. Some were killed in the journey, we didn't even come to meet them. And some were jailed, some were labeled criminals so that we can have our freedom. And I think that in programmings, in activity and events, it's high time that we celebrate our elders. It's high time that we recognize that there are elders and they don't deserve to be isolated. Thank you. I think that in my culture, the ancient culture had a very high respect of elders, and the, and these were part of the of the values of the traditional society for many years. Maybe the, the capital and the market has now pushed another values, and now one kind of productivity, beauty. Uh, has has been put in the center. But still, I, I feel, I, I have my experience is that uh, in many cases, when I am in the metro or, or in different, different uh, spaces of the everyday living, I have this kind of uh, respect for mothers. I, uh, as Davis has said, the young women used to give me the chair in the metro and, uh, and, and to help me when they feel that I need some support or, or some help. And I, uh, it's very important for me to see that still these values are among us, even when the, the market is pushing to another uh, perspective, I mean, I mean, to another goals. And, uh, and, and I, was, I was wondering about, when, I was, when we were talking about the invisibility of elders, of LGBT elders in our community, in our movements, is this because they are trying to maintain an, a, an stereotyped perspective of being LGBT or being gay? It means that you need to be this kind of strong, beautiful, and I don't know. But it's, it's a very a stereotypical perspective of, about who's gay who are lesbians. And I think that maybe they are not very comfortable to show themselves as elders, as, as a new, with a new face, no? I was just thinking about it. Mm. Yeah, when we are talking about uh, respect to the um, elderly in general, um, in my opinion, in the Netherlands, the respect for seniors is a little bit less than it used to be when I was younger. Um, and I think it has also to, um, um, because what Gloria mentioned, um, seniors are not so interested, uh, interesting anymore. They are not so sexy. They are not so productive and all those things. Another thing I want to mention here is when we are talking about queer seniors is that I also see another taboo in um, senior homes and in all kinds of environments where senior people are coming mm. or living. And the other taboo is relationships and love in general because all people don't fall in love and all people don't have sex. That's an idea what a lot of youngsters have. 
And even to give you an example, when I visit care homes in the Netherlands, it is an, uh, it's not usual that there is a double bed. So when there is a couple coming in, or just maybe one of one of the two has to be um, in that care home, and the other one wants to stay the night, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thinking about a couple who can be together for 40, 50, or even 60 years. So, and then I'm mm -hmm. talking about uh, that in general, so not just for the gay seniors, but you know, all seniors. So when we are talking mm. about love and seniors, it's something still we don't talk about. Sexuality and seniors is a taboo. Um, I'm happy they are starting to talk about it more and more, but you can see or you can imagine that that's when that's a taboo, when we are talking about queer love and other identities people are not used to, it's a bigger trouble, even a, bit, a bigger trouble. And um, so I think there is still a lot of work to do and stories and talking and training and all those things keep on talking about it. Uh, keep on that visibility, show people, show the stories, show movies, pictures, everything. One of the things we also do in the Netherlands is that we have um, uh, what we call the pink pass key. That's um, how you call that a quality certificate, care homes and other organizations like welfare institutions can get if they can show that they are really into diversity, that they can show in their management, in their personal, um, uh, I would say that's care, in all their activities, they are open-minded, but they are not just open-minded, they act also. They train their professionals. They have in their libraries a difference of books, a diversity of books, not just heterosexual stories, but also the other stories. You know, so then we have the pink pass key to uh, certainly make a certification for those specific care homes. So that queer, elderly, but also professionals can see, I'm welcome here and I can be myself. I don't have to be afraid because people know about me. They know about our background. They know about our stories. I don't have to be afraid. When it's international coming out, they, they can raise the rainbow flag without any problem. You know, all those things. Thank you. Um, sorry, Evelyn, I, I just, I know my friend hasn't said uh, something for a while, but I just wanted to draw your attention a little bit that um, we have a bit of cultural differences as in terms of relating. Um, you see, here in, in Ghana or in West Africa, our elderly, we, we don't have the tradition of putting them in a care home. So we live with our elderly ones, our elderly parents. And among those, our elderly parents, there are queer people. Um, and, and, and so the danger and the challenge for them is that um, the abuse get increased because, um, 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 and this is family, you know, care, care home or nursing home is the staff and strangers that attend to you. But it's worse in our culture where you live among family and the family that you have suffered and sometimes labored for, then treat you very badly in your old age just because of who you are or who they perceive you to be, which is very different. And you don't have the option of going for, into a care home to be looked after. No, I, I, I understand. Uh, um, there are a lot of big differences between the two cultures, how the people deal with the seniors. But I think um, there is one thing in common that we have to fight for the acceptance, the social acceptance of our queer seniors, even if it's in a um, community like what you are talking about, if people stay in their family. 
Um, mm. Because what we've seen in the past, also in the Netherlands, is that the, the queer senior people are telling stories about being kicked out of their families. And even after 50 years, they are not welcome there. Uh, also not mm. in this 2020, 2021, where you can expect people have a more uh, information, they are more developed that they can say, ah, okay, maybe that time we didn't know, but now we know. No, they keep on uh, saying you are not welcome, you are not part of the family. Those things still happen also here. And therefore, I think it's so important that in all our possibilities, uh, depending on our cultural backgrounds and, and et cetera, we have a lot of programs also in schools, in universities, in all kinds of settings that people started to learn and to know it's not a crazy thing, it's part of life. Uh, people mm. sometimes say to me, well, that's nobody in our family is like that. And then I say, I really don't know. Because maybe there are queer people in your family, but they don't tell you. Or if there is no one, maybe your, your child or your grandchild will come out. So you never can say there is no one like that in our family. Would you say, <clears throat> Davis, in your um, sort of experience and in your culture, that it, it might actually be a mo much more of a significant challenge because you're, you know, where you might be able to train staff and it's their workplace to treat people with dignity and respect. Um, it's much harder to get into individual families and particularly when the family is um, maybe dealing with um, sort of like their respectability in the community is somehow tarnished by having a, a queer relative, right? And so they are going to, ab you know, potentially abuse someone more, um, you know, because of that. I I'm just curious about your perspective in that regard. And and I guess the challenge of like, how how can you change that that culture? Because that's, that's systemic, that's going on as you say, through religion, through culture, through through society, through everything. Um, well, I've seen my colleague raise his hand, and so I, I'm going to be very quick. Um, I think the way that we will change that <clears throat> is I have, I have heard storytelling. Um, some of the things that I am beginning to do, you see, we don't have anything to fall back to um um it's it, you know unfortunately so we are now identifying who are the um, elders among us um and what is their story um and then begin to encourage them um to tell their story and so when we collect the stories we will be able to document the stories and then use this story um to then argue for certain changes. Um, at our culture says that elderly people should be treated right. The culture didn't say treat them wrongly because of their sexuality. Um, it, is, uh, it is like some uh, scriptural interpretations that says all are welcome, but it didn't have a phrase saying all are welcome except LGBTIQ people. So why then do you treat them or discriminate them? And so when we get the story, because often our people are saying, but we don't know them and we don't, on whose behalf are we arguing? Um, so we can't also take uh, stories from the West. Then they say that is the importation we are talking about. So we will encourage our elders to begin to share their story and we will use this story to begin to work for change. And it's a slow and long process, but we have to start somewhere. And that's what we need to begin to do. Okay. And sorry, thank you, Sam Pulin, for, for bearing with us. Please uh, <laughs> go ahead. My turn? Yes, of course. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I just want to share that, you know, as a um, now a six year old uh, two spirited man in living in a metropolis in Vancouver, um, I remember when I was uh, a young, 16 year old 
Coco Boy in one of the uh, gay establishments where, uh, and then I was very biased about, you know, the older queer community. Now that I'm an older uh, two-spirited man, I'm seeing the, uh, the challenge it was, you know, for our, our queer elders, right? Um, but, you know, mm. the, the big thing is that, you know, we are human beings and we're, we're sexual people, right? You know, the young people within our, I'll use Vancouver as an example, is that, you know, they don't know the work that we have done to pave the way for queer sports, you know, like me and my friends, we started Vancouver Gay Volleyball Association. We started Vancouver Gay Tennis Association. And, you know, in North America, we <clears throat> had the gay games, right? So, you know, we have paved the way for the younger people and the younger people just don't understand the sacrifices that we've made. And mm. as, as I'm getting older, I'm noticing that, you know, a lot of younger uh, people will take advantage of us, all, us older people. And, you know, it's, it is heartbreaking, you know, that young people feel the need, they need to take care, take advantage of us older queer people. Um, and, and, you know, it, as I get older, will I, again, will I have to go back, like with Cher, do what I need to go back in the closet if I get old and I need people to take care of me, right? You know, um, it, it's something that we need to continue to work on. We need to share our stories. We need to share our strengths and we need to share our challenges because as we get older you know how will we be accepted in society and uh, you know I know some within my community um, some uh, an, an two-spirited elder had to marry a woman in order to obtain a house you know, how can we break down those policies that I, don't, I shouldn't have to marry again in order to be allocated a house within my community? So, you know, there are so many things that we need to continue to do uh, within in my community, but globally as well. So, you know, thank you. Yeah, of course. No, thank you very much for raising those points. I think, um, you know, it, it, it is true that uh, our, our, you know, I think as Gloria, I believe was mentioning earlier as well, that, you know, there is such a, uh, an emphasis on, um, on youth, right? And, and sort of the, the, the desirability or the vitality of, of youth. And it's very uh, permeated in, in queer culture, particularly, uh, at least in, you know, sort of Western society, I guess you'd say. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so it does create a problem because there is that sort of invisibility uh, that happens, and it's it's sad to me that there isn't more sort of intergenerational work that happens within our community, um, and that's somehow that that's broken down. I mean, I I'm a researcher, and and I've. Uh, I'll do a little quick plug for uh, um, a website that I developed for the Bank Street BIA here in Ottawa um, called the Village Legacy Project. And it talks about local queer history uh, that happened in Ottawa and, and um, celebrates uh, our early activists in the community and, you know, raises issues like the HIV um, epidemic, the um, hate crimes that have happened here, um, and, you know, and also sort of first prides and sort of positive things that, that um, people have been able to achieve in the community. Um, but those types of things aren't taught in schools, you know, we're not, and, and our community doesn't seem to create space for that sort of work with elders and younger people in our community very often. And so, you know, I was really honored and excited to be able to work uh, to, and to moderate this panel today because I think it is, you know, these stories need to be told and these things need to be discussed and it's not brought up uh, mm -hmm. very often anywhere. So again, you know, thank you so much for, <laughs> for everything uh, that you're contributing today. Um, so I guess 
looking at the time, I think we have enough time to, to get to our second uh, sort of big question, talking about remembrance and sort of what ideas do you have around sharing uh, learning and knowledge with younger generations, which is sort of what we touched on a little bit just now. Um, what do you think is happening in your context and, and in your countries uh, um, around this? And do you have any ideas or I think uh, Evelyn had sort of brought up um, in conversation as we were sort of planning the panel about sort of best practices. So, and uh, Evelyn has her hand up, so I'll take it to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, talking about those um, intergenerational uh, meetings in the Netherlands, we organize what we call the Love is Love project. And how that started is like this. Um, I once trained a group of bicultural queer youngsters. So that were youngsters born in all kinds of other countries and raised in the Netherlands. And they said to me, well, you people in the Netherlands, they, you always live in a kind of rainbow paradise. So in their, in their idea, the queer people in the Netherlands has, have always been free and um, had the possibility to, to be themselves all, all, always. And I said, well, no. And I was, uh, was just in the time that I was doing the interviews for, for one of the books you just mentioned, um, Glenn. And so I started to tell them some of those stories. And they were surprised because then they said, hey, the stories you are telling now about those Dutch queer seniors, they sound like, they sound like our stories, that our family or our brothers and sisters, uh, they don't accept us. Our uh, religion, whatever religion it, it could be, yeah. They don't. They they don't accept us. Uh, we cannot go to the mosque or the mosque or the temple or the church because we are not accepted. The social control in their communities was like the social control we had also in the Netherlands in the past in the villages and you know it was a different time. So what we learn about that and how we do the project, we try to bring. The youngsters, the queer youngsters, we started with the youngsters with the, the, uh, the bicultural um, uh, youngsters and the Dutch queer seniors, bringing them together, have dinner together because uh, eating together is always a pleasure and a joy. And then we started with some, you can say easy, easy games to invite them to tell the story to each other. And um, we do that just for two times, two nights with two times a dinner. And it was such a beautiful thing to see that after those two nights, even after the first evening we came together, that, that they were full of surprises, both sides, you know, because the, the, also the seniors, they have some ideas about the youngsters, like, well, we, we can, we, you cannot have a serious um, talk with the young people. They are just sitting on Facebook the whole time, and, you know, it's nothing. And the other way around. But after one night, just meeting with a simple form like a dinner and some questions to invite you to tell your story, they say, hey, we can learn from each other. We can even support and empower each other. So that's... For me, is one of those best practices with a, with a very little um, uh, how you say that it's not not difficult to organize. You don't need a lot of money to organize it. It's just to find the people and bring them together and give them the opportunity to meet. And uh, it's just wonderful. I love to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gloria, I'll let you speak now. Yeah. Yes, I was thinking that last year there were a lot of uh, meetings and discussions about Regime 95. And, uh, and it was very interesting to join again with many of the lesbians who were part of the Beijing Conference in 95. And, uh, and we organized uh, a, a panel in the lesbian conference that took place in Cape Town, I mean, in the 19th. And uh, 
And it was very interesting how the young lesbians were interested in, in knowing what happened in Beijing, how did we organize? And, and we were, we had a very reflecting discussion, but it was mostly uh, fun, a fun, a fun session, because we shared some of the of, or anecdotes that we had and, and how we felt being part of this conference. And it, I, I really enjoyed that, that process. Even after that, there was a film about it and, and still now with the, with the forums that took place in, in this year in Mexico and in, even by online forums in, in Mexico and, and Paris, it was very interesting to share to the new gener generations what happened in Beijing. And, and I felt that there were many people really interested in, in knowing about that history. And, and But as Evelyn has said, it's not, for, for us in Mexico, it's not very easy to have these spaces. We have, we have had some specific uh, meetings in which uh, some young, young leaders are interested in knowing what happened before, how did this begin? And, uh, but there are not many spaces and not a large number of, of young women interested in, in these discussions. But I can say that I see that lesbians are, more, are, more, are much more interested in history than gay men as far as I, I see in, in, in the international arena and in, the, in my own country. So let's see what, why, why this happens. Mm. 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 Sampilan or Davis, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I think, um, you know, it, it, it is sort of challenging. I think that the culture is changing so much, um, at least certainly here in Canada, and I, I can't obviously speak for, for everyone in, in their countries, but um, our sense of community is, is changing so quickly, you know, uh, as I think Evelyn said, you know, like the idea of, of young people being very, you know, virtual and, you know, having things uh, online and, and so on and, and not so much <clears throat> having queer space and, and, and whether that's bar culture or community centers or, uh, you know, local businesses and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> the interest for that as, as our rights have changed and, and as people have become more integrated, I guess, in society, um, it's it, that sense of community is is different, and so um, it is. And I and I think the pandemic has sort of accelerated that process, right? We've become even more isolated, even more um, individual, and and our community has um, sort of created, I guess you could say, sort of silos of of different sort of bubbles of community, you know, sub communities, and those communities are not communicating very well with one another. So it's, it's, it's sad to see because particularly within um, our elders, there's so much knowledge, there's so much um, history uh, and there's also so much experience, you know, in terms of like, as Gloria was saying, you know, like, you know, how did, how were these things, you know, things achieved and how did you build community back then? And, um, it's so critical for those stories to come out, I think, because um, while the issues may change, um, you know, and as, you know, as culture evolves and so on, um, and as we learn more about um, different parts of our community, whether that's trans rights, whether that's um, different ethnicities and, and sort of the, um, you know, challenges that they might face with their communities or, or within their religion, um, you know, those new issues are sort of emerging, but, um, you know, the activism work that was done was 
really successful and and these you know our elders built community um from you know nothing right and so how did they do that and how can that knowledge be passed on to uh younger generations who may be facing different things may want a different way of life but um you know are still facing different challenges yeah i think different challenges at um, one hand but at the other hand i still um, uh, also in the young generations some same uh, problems for example in the netherlands and i i, I don't know exact the number but um, a big part of the homeless young people are living in the streets because they are queer mm -hmm. and they have problems in their um, families or other places. Um, the numbers of um, young queer people who try to um, um, do suicide or really kill themselves in the number of suicides is still a big number of queer people because they don't know how to deal with their um, identity. Or maybe they do, they know, but they get a lot of trouble from their environment. So when we focus on that numbers, then I, I say, okay, we have reached a lot and thanks to the queer senior generation, uh, we always said we are standing on their shoulders. So we must respect them and we talk to them and keep on the story going on. But knowing the numbers, what I just mentioned, I, I think it's something to be aware of and um, to keep on talking in schools, in, in primary schools already about diversity and, and sexual diversity and gender identity. And in the Netherlands, they have to, but I know some uh, teachers on primary schools, they find it a little different, difficult. So they don't know how to do it. And then maybe they just mention it for half an hour and then they, they said, yeah, we did. You know what I mean then? <laughs> yeah. So Pioline, I see you have your hand up. You wanted to elaborate? <clears throat> Hi, yeah, thank you for sharing uh, about our LGBTQ plus um, uh, youth. Um, here in BC, Canada, we do have a lot of Aboriginal communities that are quite isolated. And some of our youth may not feel safe in their home communities. So they'll navigate to the, our larger communities, our metropolitan, our metropolitan metropolis like Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, Montreal, uh, Ottawa is um, still a, quite a small community. Um, and a lot of our LGBTQ plus, our two-spirit youth do um, feel safer on the streets because in the, in particularly the downtown east side, there's a lot more acceptance of our two-spirited youth and they feel safer. And um, the, the homeless community is, they are is more accepting than the communities in our isolated reserves. So, you know, it's unfortunate that our two-spirited youth feel more acceptance in a homeless population versus feeling accepted in their home communities. And that's where we need to come together as a society to really learn to accept are used for who they are. And, you know, as a 60 year old man, you know, I'm still learning the, um, what it means to be a trans, a two-spirit of trans youth, you know, because I'm seeing a, a, a population of young people coming out as trans. And I'm, I'm an old shoe, I'm an old boot. Um, I grew up in a queer culture and gay culture, and I still need to learn how to use proper pronouns, and I, I still need to learn. So, you know, 
Um, how can I learn how to accept our youth, right? So, you know, it's, it's fortunate and unfortunate. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that because I agree that, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a two, you know, learning from each other is a two way street and, and, you know, while hopefully we can impart things to, uh, to our, the youth in our community, it's also, we can learn so much from them as well. You know, they're, they're reclaiming and rewriting the stories of, of and and redefining what community means uh, and should mean uh, to include themselves where they maybe weren't as included before. And so it's it's really important. And I, I am looking at the time. We are getting close to three, but I did want to give Davis an, an opportunity to, to get a last word in if he, because uh, we haven't heard from Davis in a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I'm still here and I'm taking in all the contributions that my co-panelists have been given and it's wonderful. So the, the thing is, I pick up um, uh, elderly people being taken advantage of. I am careful not to uh, make a mistake. Uh, Sam Puya, um, when I pronounce your name, so I'm always, <laughs> you know, you raise a very valuable point. It's the same story here that our elderly people, elderly queer people feel that they are being taken advantage of in many different ways. And that is very correct. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do um, um, in order to change that narrative and that situation uh, uh, with our youth. But the youth um, here, uh, homelessness, is not so much an issue um, um, like living, we are living under uh, criminalization. So when you are uh, living in criminalization, um, what you want to see if you want attitude of society to change is you trying to work so hard to get those criminalizations out of the way. And because it is there and because Ghana is now even interested in passing further criminalization and further draconian laws, it becomes um, very difficult. Uh, but the youths are taking it upon themselves that they will fight um, um, that law, they will fight that bill. And so with social media and all, um, the youth are very, very active. And sometimes I have think they, they need to understand that this is what the elders and the youth will do together and not um, um, as a divided community. So we need to work on that. And I want to round up by saying that one of the projects I want to begin to introduce is an empathy, um, empathy project that is reminding the youth that the elders were once young persons and young people and that the youths are not going to remain the way they are forever. So they should think twice how they relate to the elderly queer ones. Thank you. Really great point. <laughs> really great point. So unfortunately, wow, I mean, what a fantastic discussion. I've learned so much from each of you and I know our, our audience has as well. So it's been such a pleasure. Thank you again for agreeing to participate and to share your stories and to give us a more insight on, on some uh, queer activism and, and how things are going in, in various countries around the world. I think it's such an important discussion to have. And in particularly, of course, uh, with um, an angle of, of what's going on with, with queer elders in our community. So just to wrap up, I'd like to thank our presenting organizations again, uh, Dignity Network Canada, Fayette Canada Pride, Halifax Pride, and of course our sponsors, QP, National, and the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So um, also, uh, this is one of a series, as I think I mentioned before, uh, the next event will be on the topic of 2S LGBTIQ human rights in India today. Uh, and the event is in partnership with Pride Winnipeg. Uh, this will be on Wednesday, September 8th. Uh, and you can find more information about this particular uh, panel discussion uh, on the Pride Winnipeg website. Um, so hopefully many of you who watch today um, will be able to attend that. So just to wrap up by saying thank you so, so much to all of you 
uh, to all of our audience for, for joining in and hope whether you saw it live or whether you're watching us virtually uh, or sorry, uh, through our recording after the fact, uh, to wish everyone a happy pride uh, and to uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. So thanks so much. Lovely to, to meet you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care of you. And more